WWL Dennis Allen. Saints have to improve, but we are never going to apologize for winning. What a treat we have for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis Allen, the one and only, the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, on the air with WWL. So let's go ahead and see what Dennis, what words of wisdom Dennis has to say. Just kind of look at some of the issues that we have talked about in earlier weeks and then look at yesterday. So one penalty, five yards. Derek Carr for the first time did not get sacked, and it, that had been progressing really in the right direction. Second week in a row, 50% on third down. So I'm pretty sure the two weeks before the Bears game, it was one sack, one sack, and then no sacks in the Bears game. So the offensive line has absolutely improved. It, it's absolutely you know, they made the adjustments they had to earlier in the season. It was the worst part of the team. Uh, Derek Carr was under a tremendous amount of pressure, constantly getting sacked. Uh, Trevor Penning was throwing the game on a play-by-play -play basis. So good to see the offensive line has at least gotten a little bit better as far as pass protection. We still can't really run the ball, but... You know, baby steps. On 7 of 14 yesterday. Red zone 3 of 5, though it's a little misleading, kind of like the indie game. You ended the game, you know, in the red zone, but you were taking a knee. So in those areas that have been uh, troublesome, man, it's just, just so strong yesterday. Yeah, and look, I, I just think that's part of the process of going through a season. You know, um, you know throughout the season, you're going to have ups and downs in different areas. And, and things that you have to focus on and try to improve, uh, you know, to hopefully get better results, you know. Look, 100%. Like he's right. No team in week one is the same version in week, you know, 18, 19, the playoffs or, or whatever. No team is the same team and is good. Very rarely is a Super Bowl winner the same version of themselves that they were in week one. Very rarely is the Super Bowl winner the same version they were in week 17. Right, like you evolve throughout the season, then you all evolve in the extra weeks of the playoffs. It, it is truly a week to week leak. So Dennis is right. Like whatever problems happen throughout the season, that's going to happen, and you have to adjust. You have to be able to adjust as a, as a coach, both offensively and defensively. You know, different phases of the game uh, will get better and get worse. It's up to the coach. It's up to the front office to make those adjustments. I remember in one of the best Saints year ever the one of the best saints teams ever the team that lost to the rams in the nfc title game i believe we started the season pretty poorly i think we got rolled at home against the patriots and it looked like it looked like it was over you know adrian peterson was our starting running back and what happened we adjusted alvin Kamara became who he is marshawn Lattimore became who he is we kind of turned it over to the young guys and the team exploded and we rattled off like 12 straight wins so it, that does happen and it is a it is something that good teams can do good teams can adjust good teams can make the changes and then boom find some momentum and take off when the win loss column i think offensively we've we've done a much better job in situational football you know third down and red zone um and that's that's led to you know some increased scoring over the last few weeks um and so uh look those are all good things i think we've been doing a a good job uh, really all season of doing a good job of uh, protecting the football. So I think the number one stat for us. Let me say this about the offense. All right. I know we have absolutely crushed the offense the entire season. It is better than it was at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, it was bottom of the barrel. At the beginning of the year, it was in the conversation for the worst offense in the NFL. No doubt about it. So, Right now, is it perfect? No. Is it a good offense? No. But it does show signs of improving. And, and, I, and you know, that, that's a big part of it. You can't expect these wholesale changes to happen overnight. That's not going to happen. So these incremental changes, I would say for the Saints, have been positive. The offense in the last, we'll say, three weeks is night and day to the offense that we saw at the beginning of the year. The goal is, the hope is, that they continue improving, and in a couple of weeks, we find some consistency. Because right now, we're showing glimpses, but we can't we can't consistently put it together in back-to-back -back weeks. So once we do that, I think we'll be, if we can do that, that's the big question, if we can do that and when we do that, that's when we can sit back and say, okay, this is the Saints team. Now it's up to Dennis 
It's up to P Pistol Pete Carmichael to be able to make the changes and be consistent with those changes. Us right now is that uh, I think we're plus eight in the turnover takeaway ratio, which is which is outstanding. So we've got to continue to do those things. Now, uh... you know what helps your turnover ratio when you go plus five against the Chicago Bears. So it was quite the uh, perfect time for Dennis to bring up that little stat. Uh, Coach Allen, uh, no, it took us a while. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the second half of the fourth quarter. Uh, we forced two punts, three turnovers in the fourth quarter alone. And uh, I think that is significant uh, when you consider what we did yeah, defensively. I don't know. I, I want the fans to cheer. And then all of a sudden, uh, when they start the game, I know you probably were like scratching your head. Man, they go nine plays, 75 yards, uh, three minutes, 39 seconds. And, uh, man, we lose it 7-0. to zero. I'm looking at the last four games. We've given up 122 points and 927 yards in the first. I love when Bobby gets on here because he, he he's almost like the Sphinx in Egypt. Like, he asks a question, but it's kind of a riddle. It's kind of a word problem. You have to try and kind of, like, navigate the story or navigate what's being asked. And I'm not even sure what the question is at this point. We just, I mean, maybe he's getting to it, but I'm, I'm not totally sure what's even happening. I'm sure Dennis has absolutely no clue. But it's always it's always something different. I love that. Love the love how you got to focus in on every word to try and figure out what the hell's going on? First half. I know that's unacceptable, but you can't say it's just a flash in a pan. That's kind of been a trend. Uh, I know you could be burning that midnight oil to be able to turn that around, uh, going in a hostile environment against Minnesota on the road, for us to get off to a fast start in the first half. All right, put down in the comments below, what do y'all think the question is? What? This is the word problem. Bobby has talked for somewhere around 55 seconds. What is his question? Fill in the blank. I'll give y'all like five seconds, then I'll, then I'll answer. I think the question is, how do we start fast? I'm not sure offensively or defensively, but how do we come out of the gates hot? How, because in Indy, we were losing early, and even though we were dominating the game. In Chicago, the first half, we were, we were getting dominated. The first half against Chicago... They were doing whatever they wanted. We we It was either tied or we were losing throughout the entire first half. And then the defense got settled after halftime in both games. And then we then we you know went on to, to win the games. Green Bay was the opposite. Green Bay, we started hot. And then we got cold once Carr got hurt. But that's kind of a special situation. So I would assume he's asking, how do you start hot and stay hot? And that's it. That is, we talked about that a little bit this week on the channel with the game planning of Chicago. I'm not totally sure why the game plan to start the game seemed so bad. And then at halftime in those 15 minutes, we somehow unlocked the 2000 Ravens and we shut down what the bears were trying to do. And the bears had like 350 yards of offense in the first half, and like 120 yards of offense in the second half. So I'm not sure why we couldn't start the game with that game plan. Maybe maybe Allen was taking a chance, showing Badgett something, and then seeing what he would do. I guess seeing his pattern, seeing what he would fall into. But like I said this week, if you do that against Patrick Mahomes or Jared Goff or uh, Lamar Jackson or Joe Burrow or any of those guys, you're not going to get a second half. You do that against Jalen Hurts and the Eagles, congratulations, it's 35 to nothing. Yeah, look, I mean, that's certainly um, what our plan is every week. We haven't done that. Uh, as well as we need to uh, defensively. I thought the good thing that happened in that game is, you know, we kind of struggled a little bit early defensively. Yes. Uh, and they Very went down so. and scored. Our offense came right back and responded. Yeah. Uh, they go down and score again. Our offense comes right back again and responds again. Uh, and then in the second half, you know, we, we, we kind of struggled a little bit offensively to, to continue with the consistency. Uh, and yet our defense stepped up and, and uh, created the takeaways and made the stops that we needed to, that we needed to make. And so, um, look, we're never going to apologize for winning. Uh, it wasn't uh, our. That's a prickly, prickly Dennis. We're never going to apologize for for winning. He is a prickly pair, no doubt about it. I was going to note there before he hit me with that quote. The offense kind of died off in the second half. The first half, the offense was kind of trading shot for shot. 
uh, you know, it was shot for shot with Chicago. Like they were down three for one at the cat's meow. But in the second half, they got a lot of opportunities and they couldn't put them away. They got a lot of opportunities because of those turnovers and nothing really happened. You know, I talked about we had <clears throat> whatever it was, 19 plays <clears throat> in Chicago territory and, and we didn't do much with it. So, you, you know, it was, just, it was a tale of two halves for both the offense and the defense. And that's kind of, that's where we just got to find it. You know, we just got to find the consistency. If the defense can play like that both halves and the offense can play like that both halves, we're looking at, at a good team. You know, if the team can take what they did against Indianapolis, do it a, the following week, and then do it another week, man, we're, look, we're looking at a really dangerous team in the NFC. We just, this team just kind of seems to be one step forward, two steps back. I think they are trending in the right direction. I think it is positive right now. I think before, in the beginning of the season, it was a lot of negative. You know, it was a lot of like, man, this is not looking good. This this is a bit of a train wreck, but they have made some adjustments. We have seen some positive things happen. I, we just got to see more of it. We got to see more of it in, in a more consistent manner. Best performance overall, uh, but yet it was enough to get the win. Well, uh, you know, Coach Allen, what I'm impressed with, because uh, that was not the case last uh, year, and you talk about that turnover margin, but right now we're leading the NFL with uh, 12 interceptions. Uh, that does not having, uh, happen f- uh, by accident. And then I look at this, how you affect the opposing quarterback. Now, It's not a coincidence that we have the easiest schedule in the NFL and we play a ton of rookie quarterbacks and backup quarterbacks and we lead the league in interceptions. I say this all the time, guys. Turnovers are random. People hate hearing that. Turnovers are a bad stat, I think. T- turnovers are... In the long term, in a small, like if you're looking, this is a different conversation for a different day, but if you're looking at an individual game, turnovers are important because it'll tell you what happened in that individual game. The more you go out, out, the more you zoom out of that, I think the less impactful turnovers are. Because uh, here's an example. I'll give you two examples. Let's say a quarterback drops back and throws an interception for a pick six. In a tied ball game, he throws it right at the linebacker's chest. All right? Linebacker pick sixes it. Same quarterback, end of the first half, throws a meaningless Hail Mary in the end zone with one second left, and a defender in the end zone picks it off. Are those two interceptions the same? No. They aren't the same. They aren't the same at all. So the longer you get away from that game where that happened, the less you know what the situation was and the more you just see the number you just see one interception two interceptions right so this is a great example the turnovers that the saints are forcing against rookie quarterbacks and backup quarterbacks are those the same as forcing turnovers against patrick mahomes and joe burrow no right or what about quarterback let's say tyson badgett let's say tyson badgett throws an interception hits the cornerback right in the hands. He doesn't see the cornerback, bad throw, whatever. Cornerback picks it. Next possession, Badgett throws a perfect pass, the greatest pass he's ever thrown in his career. Hits the wide receiver in the hands. Wide receiver doesn't have the stick on his gloves, hits his hands, pops straight up. Defensive back picks it off for a pick six. Are those weighted the same? No, they shouldn't be, but they are. They're both one interception, right? Badgett had a mistake on one. He made no mistake on the other. So when you see turnovers and when you see turnover stats, be careful. Be careful. That is a very tricky stat. Uh, people throw around a lot, but you need to go deeper when, when, when you're looking at turnovers. Well, the Baltimore Ravens have been playing at a high level. We were mm-hmm. right behind them, number two in the National Football League, only giving up a QB rating of 73.2. Well, the Bears overall only had a 65.3. So I think that's imperative that that continues, the opponent uh, passer rating, because that means the quarterback is not comfortable. But the one area we were outstanding, and I know that this probably got to you, uh, the Cleveland Browns, I think, are outstanding defensively. We- By the, Hey, spoiler alert, it will continue because we're playing backup quarterbacks and rookies for the rest of the season. So we will have a, a good opposing quarterback passer rating, and none of the quarterbacks will be comfortable against us because none of the quarterbacks are comfortable playing in the NFL. All the quarterbacks are terrible. 
Tyson Badgen this last week, Josh Dobbs. Next week, we got Danny DeVito or whoever the hell is starting for the Giants in a couple weeks. We play bad quarterbacks every single week. So every single week, we should have a pretty strong percentage in uh, the opposing quarterback's uh, percentage ratings. We were number two in the NFL on third down defense at 32 and a half, but they were able to get a 50% conversion. And a lot of times to me, it would be like, who in the hell is covering the flat? I mean, I- yeah, it was all flats. It was all flats. Uh, the opposite of my wings order. All right, all drums over here. Talk about the comments below. And a, a lot of people are, are flats guys and girls. You know, I'm more of a, I'm more of a drum kind of guy. But no hate. Hey, no no wing shaming in the comments below. Okay, nobody shamed my wing wing order. All right, some people like drums. Some people like flats. Okay, it is it is what it is. Let's all let's be, you know, let's, uh, uh, you know, equality here, ladies and gentlemen. All wing orders are accepted in the comments section here. I'm an old man. I could throw that pass. Come on. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Coach Allen, that, that to me had to be frustrating to you when you see, like, uh, that we contain, like, I know we got to stop the run, they're doing a bootleg, and all of a sudden uh, the, the flat's wide open. Yeah, look, there's no question. There, there were some, some plays there that uh, we didn't execute as well as we needed to, um, and those things get, got addressed today, and we made the corrections that we needed to make. Third down's been, a, been an area that we've been – you know, pretty good defensively. Uh, we weren't as good as we needed to be yesterday. Uh, obviously, we we needed to force a few more third and longs. I think we were able to do that a little bit later in the game, and and we're able to. I like to imagine Dennis like listening to A Bear's rant, and Dennis is just in his backyard, just like walking in circles, just pissed, just walking in like a figure eight, just kicking. Just kicking sticks and kicking dirt, like as Avery just keeps going and and going and going and going, and Dennis is just has his phone on mute. He's just cursing. He's just screaming in his backyard. Get off the field a few more times uh, later in the game. So, <clears throat> look again, just like every game, you know you're going to go in. You're going to say there's some things we did well. There's some things that we didn't do well. You're going to make corrections that you need to make. Hopefully, you learn from those things and you get better at it. Coach, special teams wise, uh, Lou Headley's had nine of his in the last three games inside the. Tw- so we were actually counting this in my section. We were counting his hang time. So Headley, before the game, was one of the lowest on hang times. He was averaging like four seconds. Uh, I believe 4.3 might be the average. Someone double check me there. My uh, punter hang time averages. Like who else? Who, who else just has that on the top of the dome? But Headley actually was pretty pretty good in this game. He he had a couple good punts. Uh, hang time was there. He had a couple like coffin corners. Uh, so he was better this game. He's still in the bottom of the success rate. I saw a stat on Twitter. It might have been from my guys over at Sumer Sports, uh, Eric Eager and, and and the guys. If you don't follow Sumer Sports and Eric Eager, go follow them on Twitter. But I I think Headley was like. Fifth from the bottom, sixth from the bottom, somewhere in there. So he's improving, but he's got a long way to go. 20. Groupie started out, you know, 11 of 12, missed four field goals in his last four games. I I well remember 2021 when, you you know, you go down that path with a kicker and make changes and you ended up with four, right? The team did. I mean, I guess just give us your assessment of of Blake and you know kind of where he is from a confidence standpoint and where you are from a confidence standpoint. So obviously we've we've had Blake's back this entire season and a lot of people whenever he misses a field goal trust me my notifications my phone goes crazy with everyone telling me that he missed the field goal even though I'm in the dome. But here let me don't I don't want to get this twisted. If Groovy keeps missing kicks, get someone else in there that can't. That has never been my argument. My argument has never been that we have to stick with Blake Groupie. My argument was that if the opportunity to trade Will Lutz, Mr. 76% himself, Mr. 33 years old himself, if that opportunity presented itself that we could trade him for a seventh round pick, see you later. And if Groupie isn't the guy, hold tryouts every Monday. I don't care if we have a new kicker every single week until we find the guy. It doesn't matter to me. A, a note about Groupie. He has kicked a ton of field goals longer than like 45 yards. 
he, he's in like the top five of most field goals from that length. He's been rock solid from short. He's been rock solid from 40 or less. I think he's missed one field goal. All, most of his misses come from deep. I mean, even in this game, he was kicking long field goals. I know he's missed some short ones. I don't know if maybe Groupie is not a long field goal kicker. I don't know if he's more of like, you know, the he's there's different types of kickers. Some guys are going to just bomb field goals, and they're going to make them from 60. They're going to make them from 58. 58 might as well be 33. Other kickers are like, hey, I'm automatic from about 48 in, but I'm not kicking a 57-yarder, right? So I don't know what Blake's specialty is, but it seems like his specialty is short to medium-length field goals, and he struggles with the 50, 53, 54, 55, all those kicks. So, you know, will Blake Gruby be the kicker this time next week? I don't know. And frankly, I don't care, right? Get the kicker who can do it, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know why... Sean Payton famously, whenever kickers missed field goals, he was bringing in people to try out on Monday just to let them know, you know, and that goes for uh, Headley and, and Lutz, you know, I, or uh, Groupie. I have no loyalty toward or allegiance towards either one of them. I love uh, Blake Groupie as a brother, but if he's going to hover around that seventy six to seven or seventy six to seventy eight percent, if he's going to hover around eighty percent, you know, it's a it's a tough league for sure. Yeah, look, I think uh, all of us are still confident in in Blake Groupie. I mean, you know, uh, he was outstanding. You know, throughout training camp, he was he was good to, really to start the season. Um, you know, he's been a little bit inconsistent as of late, uh, and yet, you know, I I can go through countless examples of of uh, young rookie kickers that have had some struggles early. Some teams gave up on them, moved on. And they go on to have outstanding careers in yeah. in, in other places. He's and right. so, uh, I don't think we're at that point. Uh, it, 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 but you know, look, Blake's a you know he, he he's a he's a grown man. He knows he's got to kick the ball through the uprights, and yep. uh, we have the confidence that he'll be able to do that. Yeah, but he is right that you know Groupies, he's been inconsistent lately. But he is if he goes like three for three this week, or you know he has a game like that. All of a sudden, he's going to be like top 10 in made field goals and field goal percentage. So he is on that razor's edge. He, he needs to get it figured out, but I don't think it's time right now to, you know, to tell him to, to pack his bags. Interesting interview from Dennis. Go down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about everything that this prickly pair said. We are never going to apologize for winning. What a quote. You're telling me that Dennis doesn't listen? I'm telling you, the Saints have rabbit ears, man. They... They are they are backs against the wall kind of team. They are they are so defensive. I mean, every single week, all they talk about is the, the, what they heard, the chatter. You know, we're not going to apologize for winning. We we hear it all the time. So, I, I I appreciate the Saints watching the channel, but my God, guys, come on, get get some get some tougher skin. You know, let me know in the comments below what you think. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.